Shalom, shalom, and welcome back to our Saturday service. It's always a great privilege for me to be able to share his wonderful word. We are already in the 10th chapter of Revelation, and the deeper we go, the more we learn about the intricate battle between good and evil. The book of Revelation represents their last battlefield. And while evil is very powerful, the recurring theme is that it has no chance at victory. For this book shows us that it acts only at the command of God and according to his final plans for the universe. And while evil could have been put away with just one breath, from the Almighty. If this war drags on, it is surely so that we can further appreciate God's patience, His sovereignty, and especially His love. A love which He demonstrated through the Messiah who being from above came down to redeem men and is now always seeking that repenting heart, seeking who He might save. And this, is, th this will be even to the last moment of the end of this era. This book really brings out the need for salvation and it is my prayer that if you have not yet seen or felt the power of love through Yeshua, that today you will see him and invite him into your life so that he will cover you with his salvation. That is his name in Hebrew, Yeshua. And once you believe in him, you will spend eternity with your creator. Now before we begin... Uh, that to delve into this great chapter, let us bless and commit our children to the Lord. Uh, they also have uh, their own little service, by the way, at 9.30 a.m. every Saturday morning through Zoom. And I know they are being blessed by the work of many teachers. Let us bless them now. If you have your children, bring them closer to you. Put your hands upon them. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kevod Malchuto Le'olam Va'ed Blessed be His name whose glorious kingdom is coming and is forever and ever. Heavenly Father, we ask that Your strong arms of protection be around our children, that they may be held safely with Your love, especially during these times where so many are calling good what You despise and are even encouraging the youth to partake in their ways. Protect our children, Lord, and fill their hearts with your presence. Fear their days and nights with, with hope and joy. Fill their minds with your truth and light. Let them know through the presence of your spirit what is right, what is true, and teach them to shy away from evil. And I ask that you bless the parents with the mighty presence of your Ruach HaKodesh and show them the way to love and to teach, to bless, to direct our children. Beshem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen and Amen. So let us open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 10. It is a short chapter, but let us not rely on the appearances, for it contains some powerful words, and it's quite deep. In the context of the whole book, this chapter stands between the two accounts of the tribulation times. At the last verse of this chapter, John is told, you must prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. In the next chapter 11, John will be brought down to earth to the temple in Jerusalem that will be built, I believe, very soon. And like a reporter in the battlefield, John will focus on people like the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the two witnesses. Up to this time, he was seeing all these things from heaven and looking down. So this chapter 10 is also quiet enigmatic. For instance, John will hear a prophecy, and just as he's about to write it down, he is told not to. And of course, the reader is, wh who expected to hear all about it is now, are now left with their thirst and hunger hanging on. What kind of prophecy could this be when we know that something is said, and yet we are kept from knowing its content? Why do we need to hear about it in the first place. Then, as we enter into the, the, this chapter, one expects to hear about the third woe and the seventh trumpet, but the third woe is not mentioned here or anywhere else in the book. And this, the, the enigma keeps its course throughout the book. As for the seventh trumpet, as soon as it sounds in the next chapter, the reader is taken up to heaven to witness a jubilee of victory and experiences the end of the trumpets. But what happened to an earlier event of that seventh trumpet? 
The same thing occurs later with the seventh bowl. As soon as it is poured, we are taken from earth back to heaven, skipping over the first part of the seventh bowl, only to hear about how everything is now finished and done. There are obviously some facts we are spared when it comes to details. But this may be another touch of grace from the author. Furthermore, we will read in this chapter about the seven peals of thunders. While, while, while their voice are, are heard and their words are not written down, the question also is, to whom do these seven voices belong? Chapter 10, ten that is bridges between the two parts of Revelation and while it contains so much it also refrains from giving it all away. Nevertheless all of this further enhanced the grave importance of these short times of seven years while evil will be put down and bound and eventually forever and ever. Now let us begin by reading the first three verses and see how these things are brought to us by the Spirit. Here we're going to begin to meet, we're going to meet, that is, a very powerful angel. Verses 1, And I saw another strong angel coming down out of heaven, clothed with a cloud, and the rainbow was upon his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire, and he had in his hand a little book which was open. He placed his right foot on the sea and his left on the land, and he cried out with a loud voice as when a lion roars, and when he had cried out, the seven peals of thunders utter their voices. You know, the account begins with a description of a strong angel. While this angel looks so much like Yeshua, he is not, he is not, for Jesus is not another angel. He is their Lord. He created them, and they worship Him. If this angel looks so much like his master, it's surely because he loves them just like we believers and are told to what? Put on the Messiah. Put on the Messiah. It's always amazing to see them always working in unison, in harmony, and looking like their God. Just like Ezekiel in Ezekiel, when he saw them in the first chapter, so is John seeing them here. And we are told that his face, by the way, was like the sun, just like Yeshua in chapter 1, verse 6, six that is, where we read that his face was like the sun shining in its strength. We are told that his feet like pillars of fire, just like his master, whose feet were like burnished bronze when it, he has made to glow, it was made to glow in a furnace in chapter 1, verse 15. Like his creator, this strong angel reflected his holiness and strength against evil. And this is what we learn today for us, right? Because as, as we go deeper into the word, as we go deeper into learning about God and his character, we out to put him on, that is to look like him as well. But see, See that we are told that he is another strong angel. And if he is another with this title, where is the other one? This is where we see something very important, very interesting. For both strong angels open and close the first account of the tribulation. The first strong angel was there at the opening of the first seal by the lamp uh, back in chapter 5. And there we read, we read, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seal? This is where the first seal was about to be opened. And here in chapter 10, another angel of, of the, the same type comes just before the opening of the seventh seal to stamp victory. And we see in the description how powerful these strong angels are. And surely to confront and restrain the evil horde that will invade the earth. See that we are told that this one comes down from heaven surely to counteract the fallen angel to whom was given the key to the bottomless pit. Uh, from where demons rise and they will be met with strong angel. This same word strong is used when describing the power of an army and we are and why are angels that is taking so much space in Re revelation account let us not forget that the last battle are their fight just as the universe fell because of an angel so at the end it is given to these good angels to subdue evil 
They are the ones who will do most of the work. Man works alongside with the Spirit to preach the good news. Angels, especially in Revelation, work alongside the Spirit to subdue demons. This is why there are over 80 references of angels just in the book of Revelation. Now, this angel, notice, has in his hand a little book which is opened. What is this book and why is it opened? John calls the scroll Bibla Ridion, which is a form of a diminutive of Biblion, the same word for scroll, and from where we get the word Bible. But how small is this book? It is hard to tell. See that it is a small book in the hands of the angels, but when John is about to take it, it becomes Biblion in verse 8. One wonders if the size of the book is in relation to the size of the angel. But this, is, but this one is already open and it seems that in there are written the events of the second rendering of the tribulation times as we will see toward the end of the chapter and also in the next chapters but see now what lies on the head of the strong angel the rainbow was upon his head the rainbow why a rainbow and which which is it because he says the rainbow it must be the sign of the covenant the everlasting covenant that god made with nature and man the sign of the noahic covenant this rainbow is also described as being seen above the throne of god in chapter 4 but what why its presence here in chapter 4 in chapter 10 remember how the demons wanted to destroy nature but only one third of nature was given over to them to destroy during the first four seals this angel with the rainbow is surely there to confirm that not all will be destroyed and it shows how powerful this individual is for he will brittle and check these lawless demons now see where he lays his feet also on the sea and on the earth, thus claiming God's ownership over his creation. The, the position, this angel over the earth and the sea must be, must be very important. For three times in this chapter, we are reminded that this angel stands, stands upon the sea and upon the earth. Verse 2, verse 5, and verse 8. This may also highlight even more the angelic fight. For we know very soon, in chapter 13, we will read that the beast which comes out of the sea and the false prophet which comes out of the land. Already we we can have a foretaste of the, the heavy battle that will ensure between these two forces. And if his right foot is on the sea and his left on the land, we can see that this angel is facing south, looking over the land of Israel and Jerusalem, for soon we will see that the Holy Land will be the center of the action. We may also note that the land itself may represent Israel while the sea represents the nation. Again, the sovereign Lord is superintendent over all of all what it is that is. That is when we are told that he cried out with a loud voice as when the lion roars. Like a warning over all the earth. For when in the scriptures a lion roars, it is an admonition of terrible times to come. This angel announces the last moments of the tribulation. And it is then when we hear the voice of the seven thunders. This must be very important as well, for they are also mentioned three times in verses 3 and in verses 4. Whose voices are these? In the Hebrew scriptures, and here in the New Testament, the voice of God is often spoken as of as a thunder. And here it is seven thunders as the complete and perfect judgment of God at the very end. Among the many passages which speak of God's voice as a thunder, let us look at one of them. When on Mount Sinai, when Israel became a nation and at the moment of the giving of the law, we read in Exodus 19, 19, when the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him with thunder. Thunder. It must have been very loud and very impressive for this is when the Israelites told Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but let not God speak to us or we will die. Now imagine seven times the voice of the Lord, the world will know for God will move heaven and earth for everyone at the end to understand so they can make this decision. 
That is a decision of salvation. And what is so interesting is that there is a Jewish tradition which says that there were seven voices of God thundering at Sinai, just like we have it in Revelation 10. But how did they come to this conclusion? It is more than a tradition. It is based on another powerful passage of Psalm 29, which speaks of the seven voices of God when he comes to judge the earth just before he comes back. This psalm opens in such a powerful way, speaking to angel, and we can imagine it being read in heaven just before the strong angel spoke. This is how Psalm 29 opens up, verses 1 and 2. Ascribe to the Lord, O sons of the mighty, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength, ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name, worship the Lord in holy array. The sons of the mighty, Bnei Elohim, are, are the angels. They, they are called sons in the sense that they are directly created by God. Angels are called to uplift God's name and ascribe to the Lord glory, strength, holiness. And this worship is just before the pouring of just judgment, just like it is in Revelation 10. <clears throat> and the rest of the chapter speaks of the seven voices of God. Here they are. You can see them on the screen. This is how the first voice is described. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. Here we hear the voice, the thunder God over all his creation, claiming it for he is the creator. The waters are also symbolic of the nations, as we, are, well, we have said. The nations of the world in rebellion, uh, as we mentioned, that the, the, the Antichrist is rising out of the sea. But our Lord is sovereign even over them. Then David describes each of the remaining voices as powerful, as majestic, as breaking the cedar in pieces. It is a voice which hews out flames of fires and shakes the wilderness and strips the forest bare. These are the seven voices of God over his creation and just before he comes back to establish his kingdom, just like it is written again in Revelation 10. See the last verse of this psalm. The Lord set as king at, at the flood. Yes, the Lord sits as king forever. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. These seven voices of thunders of the Lord had a strong, by the way, impact in Jewish tradition, even up to today. Not only have they seen it in Sinai, but every Shabbat, <clears throat> they are reminded of the impact of these seven voices. Of the seven benedictions on the Shabbat, the Talmud explains that these are based on the seven voices of Psalm 29, as it is written. As to the seven benedictions of which the prayers for the Shabbat is made up, to what do they correspond? They correspond to the seven voices that David said were over the waters in Psalm 29. And it goes even further. The weekly parasha, that is the portion of the weekly reading of the Torah in the synagogue, is not only done in one reading, but in seven reading, in seven individual readings by seven men. This is when seven men go up to the bima to read the Torah. Going up to the Torah is called an aliyah, which is in Hebrew for the word for going up. It is considered, by the way, an honor to be called of, for one of the seven aliyots. The Zohar and the Talmud explain why seven persons as well. They say in the, in the, in the Zohar, on that day seven persons are called up to take part in the public reading of the law corresponding to the seven voices amidst which the Torah was given, referring to the seven voices of Psalm 29 and the, of course for us the seven thunder through which, that is which we, we, we hear in Revelation chapter 10. So these seven thunders was not a strange thing for the Jewish reader of the time who must have linked it right away to God's judgment of the end times. But what are these seven thunders saying? This is what is hidden from us. Look at verse 4, Revelation 10. When the seven peals of thunders are spoken, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up the things which the seven peals of thunders have spoken, and do not write them. Do you remember what, when you were a teenager, or maybe uh, you have some teens at home uh, with you now? 
Wh whatever our parents told us not to do, we had this urge to prove them wrong. And here John is told not to write what he heard. And this is what we really want to know. We want to know what the voices are saying, why we are not allowed to know, and why, why if John heard them, we cannot. And this is when we are to remember one of great passage of the scriptures in the Torah, Deuteronomy 29, 29, where Moses says, The sacred things belong to the Lord, to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever that we may observe all the words of this law. These words, I want to tell you, come from a man who saw God face to face just as a man speaks to his friend. And Moses understood that there are some things too lofty for us to know right now. So if we are not told, it is because we are not supposed to know what it is in there. But what we are given is the great privilege to know that these mysteries do exist, right? Which may very well contribute to our excitement to reach heaven when we will have the full, fuller, that is, knowledge of things. But what we are not told must probably be the content of the third woe. For the third woe is not mentioned anywhere in, the, in Revelation. It must also, that is after this time, it must also be the full content of the seventh trumpet which correspond to the third woe. For we are only told the end part of the seventh trumpet. And see how it is mentioned in Revelation 11:15, the seventh trumpet. He says, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of the Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. But this is hardly a woe. This is a victory. The reason why we are not told of the content of the seven thunders and part of the seventh trumpet, it is perhaps because this last moment of the tribulation will surely be the greatest spiritual battle of all times. Above all that man can take or understand. So we are not told, but we are brought right away to safety in heaven to witness the victory. And if we are, we are made aware of these hidden things, it is also to realize the great severity of these times. We are, all, we are giving so much, and the rest of Revelation is about to reveal even much more. And it is dayenu, enough for us and for the and believers that is to run to God when he reala they realize all these things. Now, furthermore, this omission we find in the seventh trumpet teaches us about the way Revelation is written with again, and this is a recurring theme, again with such a concern for the reader so as to lessen, always lessen the impact of the prophecies that are contained in there. You know, there are beautiful poses through the chronology which runs through chapter 11 to chapter 19. We are to look out before moving into the next section. From the next chapter, chapter 11, until chapter 19 of Revelation, we are brought to see the final victory at least six times. As if to say, whatever you're reading now, with all the trauma and plagues, it's only for a short time. In five of these f six passages, we are brought to heaven to witness the victories. And in one of them, we are brought on Mount Zion. Right? At the second coming, as Zachariah prophesied. Let me show you this sixth citation and how we can take away from this uh, God's consistent and unshakable presence, especially during evil times. Again, this is very exciting for it is as if, again, th th these are symphonies of victory. Saying again, you see, as powerful as it is, I will protect you, the Lord says. First, in the next chapter, chapter 11, after the mention of the third temple, wh where the Antichrist will sit and pretend to be God, and after the mention of the two witnesses and their battles and their death and their resurrection as well, we are told in verse 15, we've just read, that the kingdom of the, uh, 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 of the world has become the kingdom of the Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Second, in chapter 12, where we see Satan after Israel, and where we are told of the war in heaven between good angels and demons, and after the binding of Satan, for which no details are given. We are right away reminded of God's victory in verse 10, where it says, Now the salvation 
and the power and the kingdom of God and the authority of his Messiah has come for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before our God day and night. You, 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 would, you would have thought that this is the end of the book, but no. Third, after the mention of the Antichrist and the false prophet and the ravages that they, they, they cause on earth, we are again brought to the victory actually in heaven. We read in verse 14, and this one, by the way, is a victory on earth. In chapter 14, verse 1, he says, Then I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his Father written in their foreheads. Fourth, well, then before the, the, the seven bowls are poured, and these are, by the way, the worst, the worst in, in chapter 16. We are, but before that, we are brought to heaven to see the victory. We read in chapter 15, verse 3, And I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fi fire, and those who had been victorious over the beast and his image, and the number of his name standing on the sea of glass, holding harps of God. And they sang, what? The song of Moses. Fifth, as we have seen at the seventh bowl, when we expect to see yet the worst of things, we are right away brought to heaven and told in chapter 16, verse 17, Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. It is done. Uh, I'll take this time instead of another describing evil. You know, but this is not the end. Six. At the end, finally, we read in Revelation 19, verse 1, After these things, I heard something like a loud voice and a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. You, you, you see the flow? Do you see the flow of grace in one of the most difficult books which speaks about evil? Six times we're told to show that evil will not prevail. Perhaps to show that the number of the beast, 666, will be concurred and crushed under the weight of love. The Bible says, beautiful passage, Song of Songs 8.6, that love is as strong as death. Many rabbinical commentators understood that the Song of Songs is the love story between Israel and her God. And one commentator expressed God's love in the book, uh, by, by saying this, he says, My love for you is so strong that I would rather die than give up, give it up. Right? This is his interpretation of Song 8-6. But since the Song of Songs is also the love story of every believer with his or her Messiah, we can attribute these words of Yeshua as well, who demonstrated his love by dying and by resurrecting and by covering us with his love and this at all times. Now, after having seen and being assured of this chronology of love, we have the strength to proceed and see what lays ahead. And let us follow the text and see the strong angel's reaction after he heard the words of the seventh thunder. You can feel even his excitement in verses 5 and 6. He says, Then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted up his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things in it and the earth and the things in it and the sea and the things in it, that there will be delay no more. Here the strong angel makes an oath. And what is strange, what is strange is that he quotes a passage from the fourth commandment on the Shabbat, word for word. But that, why does he actually speak of these words, of these words right here? The Shabbat itself was a covenant with man and nature. It is very much an extension of the everlasting covenant with Noah, which commanded man and beast and the earth to rest. This Shabbat commandment, it commands us to rest on the seventh day and furthermore for the earth to rest every seventh year. But instead, we see the destruction of both men and nature. And perhaps by quoting these words on the Shabbat, this angel emphasizes the sure establishment of the messianic times, which will be a great Shabbat for the creation. It is the seventh actually they see it as the seventh year some rabbis actually understood the history of humankind to last six thousand years and then the seventh one thousand years will be the messianic times and this strong angel makes an oath to heaven that surely 
this time will come. And this is when finally we read in verse 7. But in the days of the voice of the seven angels, when he is about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished as he preached to his servants the prophet. What is a mystery? Not something hidden, but something revealed. It is actually the opposite, right? When you see a mystery in the New Testament, it is, uh, it is something that is revealed to you. A mystery in the New Testament is something that is revealed, and so they now become a revealed mystery. And the word mystery is used 27 times in the New Testament. Paul uses it 21 times to reveal great things uh, that, that could not be understood apart from the life and ministry of Yeshua Mashiach. Even the Old Testament cannot fully, we cannot fully understand it if you remove the Messiah from it. So things are not revealed. Okay, like the, some things that is are not revealed, that the content of the voices of the seven thund thunders, but these are no secrets. But unrevealed information that is not necessary for us, but secrets are revealed for our understanding. So when someone promises you to show you secrets in the Bible that no one saw before, what in the world could he show you that the Lord has not revealed to us? And the mystery, the mystery of God we have seen is Yeshua himself. We have seen in Colossians 2.2 where Paul says God's mystery that is Yeshua himself. This mystery is when the world will see him, will see Yeshua and recognize him as the king of kings. And this will be the moment of the second coming when Israel will see him and they will recognize the one they have pierced. Then it will be the end of the tribulation. The end, by the way, is actually uh, described for us by in Daniel's, in Daniel's prophecy when he spoke about the 490 years. He described the end in six different blessings. Do you remember? To finish the transgressions, to make an end of sins, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Again, six is the number of man. Man was created on the sixth day. Six is the number of labor, for man was to work six days in the sweat of his face. Six is the number... The, his time and here the spirit uses six things to reverse the curse into blessings this is when the mystery of God will be ended and the first by the way the first three of these blessings are tied into when man was prevented from communion with God transgressions sin iniquity however looking at the fourth the fifth the sixth blessings we see that through his righteousness through the sealing up of the visions and prophecy and through the anointing of the most holy the full establishment and workings of the Messiah will come to pass and the king of kings will take his long-awaited place on this earth this is what amounts again to the mystery of God being finished. The sealing up of the visions and prophecy is also mentioned in Revelation 10. The last words of verse 7, as he preached to his servant, the prophets, it is written. This is a most important information, especially in the light of what comes next. First, what it says is that all that we need to know in the future is here in the word of God. We don't need to know more than that. And there's so much in there. God previously said in Amos 3.7, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servant, the prophets. And here at the end, he confirms it. He confirms that all the prophecy of his servant, the prophets, they were all fulfilled so far, okay, with a hundred percent accuracy. In fact, if it's not hundred percent, it is not from God. This is greatly enhanced when we learn in the next three verses, verses 8 to 10, here John is told to do something quite unusual. And that, by the way, speaks to us. And when we encounter the unusual in the Bible, it is to awaken us up of something extraordinary. Let's read verses 8 to 10. Then the voice which I heard from heaven, I heard again speaking with me and saying, Go take the book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel telling him to give me the little book. And he said to me, Take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter and your mouth. It will make you be as sweet as honey. I took 
the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. And in my mouth it was sweet as honey. And when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. Let me begin by saying that John ne did not eat any paper, right? We know that. But there is a beautiful truth about the Word of God and how close we ought to be to it. When always, when we should always be immersed actually in it. First, it is in verse 8 where the book is not so little anymore, but now it's called Biblion, as we have mentioned. But if the word changes here, perhaps it's to enhance its importance to men. For this book is our lifeline to heaven. It is written for men to know what the future holds. It is written for men to know the character of God. For this book... This open book may contain the full second again rendering of the tribulation plus what comes after something we don't want to miss. What is it? It is the description of our eternal abode, the description of heaven itself, right? Which starts in chapter 20, 21, 22. But see what he told John to do. He tells him to eat the book and he adds, it will make your stomach bitter and in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. Since it is a figure of speech, it allows us to seek what each word symbolizes. First, the use of the word stomach is often to describe the deep recesses of man, the inner part of man. Innermost being can very well describe the word koilas, that is stomach. As for the word bitter, in, in the Greek, well, many things are, are, are indeed hard and bitter to learn, Especially in this book, the word comes from the word, another word, pikros, meaning pointed, sharp, keen, wise. And this is so appropriate when it comes to the word of word. It will make a person who eats it sharp and keen and wise. And David realized that when he said in Psalm 119, Psalm 119, this is, this is the chapter really of the word of God. In verse 98, your commandment make me wiser than my enemies for they are ever mine. David saw beyond all the riches that a king could, could own to the power of the scriptures which he recognizes that they made him keen, sharp, wise. And John saw that it tastes like honey. And according to David, it seems that the more you read it and the better it tastes with time. See what he says in Psalm 110, 103. How sweet are your words to my taste? Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth read it read it over and over and it will be sweeter and sweeter this that that, that is the more you ponder on it the more it reaches the f as far as the division of soul and spirit the best therapy is the reading and the study of the word of god and how often shall we relish relish that is the scriptures how often have have we do we eat every day see what yeshua said in Ma matthew 4 4 Man shall not live on bread alone, but out of every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. When Yeshua pronounced these words, it was towards the end of a 40-day temptation when he was at his weakest point and very hungry, but it was not the time to eat our natural desires and need should not dictate our spiritual walk. His answer is a citation from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. There the Lord reminded the Israelites that while he led them through these 40 years of testing by feeding them manna, he also reminded them that more than food, his word will feed them and save them. And here the true manna, the true manna was standing and being tried, reminding us as well and more so that we need to daily go to the word of God where we find the source of power. This is when. We come to the last verse of this chapter, which helps us to make sense of the whole chronology of Revelation. Revelation 10, verse 11. And they said to me, you must prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. The word again, palin, means to go back, to turn back. And in the case of John, he was to give another account of the tribulation. And it would not be easy. Not only for the subject matter, but interestingly, the word itself, palin, comes from the word pali, which means to wrestle, to wrestle. And here John will be brought yet to a most difficult part of tribulation. And I can't wait to get there. How different will this one be? The angel explains it. 
concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. As we mentioned in the introduction, the second account will focus on the actors themselves, like the Antichrist. We, 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 know, we know him as the rider of the fourth of the four horses, by the way. Now we will know of his personality and of his Jewish partner, the false Jewish prophet, whom Israel will most probably acclaim as their own Jewish Messiah. We will find out more about Israel, about the temple, about the Jewish people, the world enter the system of Babylon and the mark of the beast. Chapter 11 brings us, by the way, and it starts, brings us down right to Jerusalem on the Temple Mount, where John measures the temple, right, the third temple, and he introduces us to the two witnesses. Who are the two witnesses? And what is their ministry? This is what we will find out next time. You know, to conclude, I want to encourage you to stick with the Word of God, to study the Word of God. John was not the only prophet who was told to eat the Word of God. Ezekiel was asked, and another prophet, Jeremiah, who also tasted of the sublime blessings of the scriptures. We can learn so much from these two prophets, by the way, Ezekiel and Jeremiah, when we consider the moments they manifested their joy in knowing the word. When Jeremiah spoke these words, he was not at the best place in history, for he was given to see the fierce judgment on Israel and on the world as well. His prophecies are an account of the sev severe punishment so harsh it was so hard for Jeremiah that he often complained, but he knew where to meet God. This is what we read in verse 16. Beautiful words of chapter 15. Your words were found and I ate them, he says to God. And your words became to, for me a joy and the delight of my heart, for I have been called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. When things are not going the way we want, there is one place where we can always find the Lord in his living word, where he is always waiting to reveal great and mighty things to those who believe in him. As Jeremiah says, he, that he, called, uh, by, he was called by his name. This is, that is, that he revealed himself in the word. As for Ezekiel, we learn an inviolable lesson from the events surrounding the time when he was asked to read or to eat, that is, the book. We can readily see the message when we consider the chronology uh, of chapter 3. If you have time, just read it, which explains the process of Ezekiel's commission. There you know that five times Ezekiel is asked to go and proclaim the word of God. Five times, five times, not because he was stubborn, but because there was a process. And there, okay, the process that is, that is also for every other believer. Let us look at the commandment itself. I'm just going to read it to you. In verse 1, God says, go and speak to the house of Israel. In verse 4, go to the house of Israel and speak my words. In verse 11, go to the exiles, to the sons of your people and speak to them and tell them whether they listen or not. Just tell them because a prophet, an evangelist is also a witness. And at the end, in verse 23 and 24, where where he beheld the glory of the Lord, and when the Spirit of the Lord entered him, okay, because why? Because this is where he agreed to go. But something happened right after the first call. As soon as it happened, we read that. So, Ezekiel, he opened his mouth, and he fed. He says, God fed me with this scroll. And he said to me, Ezekiel says, Son of man, feed your stomach and fill your body with this scroll which I am giving you. Then I ate it, and it was sweet as honey in my mouth, just like John. See the whole process so effectively do, okay, and proclaim God to others. First, there's a call. God calls, and if you are a believer in Yeshua, rest assured that he called you. Rest assured that he is calling you even now. Second, Ezekiel will to do the work, and how? Did he manifest it by opening up his mouth, that is his mind, his inner self, to receive the word of God, which the Lord right away fed him. And then slowly but surely, Ezekiel ate it. And then he saw, only after that, he saw the glory of God. And then the Spirit lifted him up, right? Ezekiel fulfilled the ministry he was called to do and succeeded with flying colors. You know why? Because even after 2,500 years, we still speak of him. Ezekiel should be every believer's name. It is from the word Hatzak, 
meaning strong, powerful. And from the word El, God, Ezekiel, the mighty man of God. Let us bow our head in prayer. Now, Heavenly Father, teach us to be like you. Mold us into your image. Teach us to love. You are the God who sanctifies, so we ask that you work in us what is pleasing to you just like you worked in John and also in this angel and encourage our hearts in your ability to bring us to maturity, both as individuals and also as a congregation. Because today, Lord, we wish to be lost in you. Touch each and every one who is listening who is present, and do not let any of us lose our first love. Revive us, sanctify us, allow us to let your Ruach HaKodesh to saturate every faculty, subdue every passion, and use every power of our nature for obedience to you. In Yeshua's name do we pray. And to the congregation, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen and amen.